Hello everyone, you're listening to For Those We Lost. I'm your host, Jennifer Sullivan. Thank you for being here. If you've lost a loved one to COVID and would like to share your story on the show, please send me an email. My email address is for those we lost podcast at gmail.com or go to the website for those we lost podcast.com and click on the contact button and you can reach me that way as well. In this show, people share their stories of losing a loved one to COVID. Each of these stories is heartbreaking, inspiring, and honest. We are candid about how hard it is to move on from our grief, how we relive the events leading up to our loved one's death, and the difficulties in carrying this loss with us through the political turmoil happening in the world right now and in the face of people who don't believe COVID is real. You may hear things in our stories that make you cry, and you may hear things that make you angry. You might hear us talk about politics or the vaccine, and you may not agree. But I hope you'll keep listening. I hope you'll stay to the end of each episode and realize that each person who openly shares here has experienced deep grief over the loss of a loved one. And that's something we will all experience. We all love someone, We will all lose someone we love, and we will all grieve. These are the stories of those we lost to COVID. Thanks for being here with me today. I've got a great show coming up for you. I want to give you a little backstory on this episode. When I first joined the online COVID support groups on Facebook, I saw people posting photos of different memorials to their loved ones. I saw pictures of candles and gatherings, and I knew that there were people out there creating memorials. I was too heartsick at the time to send out my mom's name. I guess that just made it more real for me that she was gone. But specifically, I knew of a woman in New Jersey who started a memorial for her brother on the beach and how she added rocks in the shape of a heart to the memorial. Each rock had the name of someone's family member who died of COVID. A few rocks turned into hundreds and then thousands, and one heart on the beach turned into many. And then I started recording this episode you are about to hear with Rima. She talks about losing her brother to COVID and the troubling circumstances of his death, and the lack of control she felt at the medical decisions made at the end of his life. This is a powerful episode. But then Rima started telling me about the memorial she started for her brother, and how people messaged her to write their family members' names on rocks and place them at the beach. And I realized halfway through recording this episode just who I was talking to. Rima has done amazing work in the COVID community. Her memorial for her brother is called Rami's Heart COVID-19 Memorial, and most recently all the hearts were moved from the beach, each name was cataloged, and they have been placed in a permanent location that will become part of the National Memorial for COVID Victims in the United States. We recorded this episode on July 14th, 2021, and all of the contact information for Rima and her brother's memorial are in the show notes. Rima is remarkable, and her love and devotion to her brother and her mother show through in each second of this episode. And with that, I'd like to welcome Rima to the show. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing good, and you? (laughs) Good. Good. So what I want to start with is I want to go back to March of 2020, and... I want to start with you just uh, telling the story about what happened, how you heard about COVID, um, when, and and then what happened with your brother. Okay. So um, March 2020, I was working in New York City. 
uh, Manhattan. I had heard about COVID, um, obviously through the news and stuff, but I wasn't um, too concerned about it. I um, I don't know why. I, it's really weird since I worked in the elective surgery field. Um, I didn't take it on to, like, I wasn't worried about it hitting home, if that makes sense yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then little by little, um, you know, the lockdown started around March 20th for me. And then shortly after I lost my job, um, and then, you know, my brother lost his job too. And then April came. And for me, April is when everything started as far as uh, COVID hitting home. Um, my brother started to get sick. Uh, he went three days with really high fevers um, and he had zero appetite. He was starting to have problems breathing around the second and third day and was just physically in a lot of pain. So uh, on April 16th, we called an ambulance and he went into the hospital. Uh, I again, didn't think that, you know, him going in the hospital meant he would never come back out. So, um, when he went in, they said they had discovered water around his lungs and that they were going to remove the water and that they did a, a COVID test and my brother came out negative. So that shortly after he should be fine and he should be coming home. But um, as each day went by, my brother just got worse rather than better. And then all of a sudden, his kidneys went into failure. So he was going to start to have to do uh, kidney dialysis. Mm. Um, so just a little backup, too. My brother had a traumatic brain injury when we were younger at the age of 17. And through years and years of therapy, he had really improved his quality of life. I don't necessarily like to say that people with a traumatic brain injury are healed because what happens is they, they will always have a side effect. Um, and unfortunately with my brother, you know, when he's under a lot of stress and a lot under a lot of pressures, one of the side effects that he has is he loses short term memory. So unfortunately with Rami, when he was in the hospital, uh, one of the times that they were giving him dialysis, he actually had woken up and not knowing where he was or what was going on. He actually pulled the wires out in the middle of dialysis, which caused him to go into cardiac arrest. Oh. Yeah, and they, they brought him back after about seven minutes. Um, but after that, my brother stays in the hospital. He was induced into a coma and then he was also restrained so he wouldn't do any self-harm mm -hmm. so I was unable to get like any kind of um FaceTiming with him it literally was just my mother and I taking turns calling in daily uh just to see what the status was and to get updates on my brother's uh condition um but little by little my brother started to pull through um, I want to say after like 23 days of being in the hospital, he was on a ventilator for a few days. He came off of it. Um, my brother started to get better. Mm -hmm. And at one point they even called us and said that my brother can actually come home on, on May 8th. They, I'm sorry, May 7th. They said that, you know, he was showing a lot of improvement. He probably would still need dialysis for another two weeks. Uh, but he can come home and we would just have to, you know, make sure he reports to his dialysis treatments three times a week. Um, very shortly after, I want to say like six or ten hours later, they called back and said that he couldn't come home. Uh, they let us know that a nurse that was attending to my brother tested positive for COVID. And therefore, um, because of that, my brother would have to be quarantined for 14 days. And, uh, you know, after that, he could come home. But because he didn't need any intensive care, um, they basically said that he would be transferred to a rehabilitation center or a nursing home and that he would be quarantined there. And we wouldn't have to worry because they would take him to his dialysis treatments there. Um, but unfortunately, my brother was transferred to uh, Wynwood facility and he died within 48 hours of being transferred there. 
Did he, was he tested for COVID? He was never tested again after the initial, uh, you know, time that he was tested at the beginning of his visit to the hospital. Um, I know it now looking into things and, and meeting with different people back then, if you entered a facility and you tested negative, um, there was a uh, regulation that you are not to test a patient again once they were tested once coming into the facility. So, mm. yeah, it's really weird. Um, that so, is odd. Yeah. The reason being, they said, was, you know, they were low on testing. Mm -hmm. But my brother was being treated as though he was COVID positive. And uh, when he was transferred to Winwood facility, he was placed in the COVID zone. Because when I went to go claim his body, we had to go to the COVID area, which, you know, was um, taped up and they let you know that you're entering into a COVID zone. So why don't you um, tell me everything that you know and experienced from when your brother was transferred there? Because he was in the hospital for quite a long time. And then he was getting better, and then he goes to this facility, and he passes away within just a couple days. Right. Um, so with the facility, it was such a huge difference than from him being in the hospital. Um, you know, at the hospital, we were able to call, or we received a call and spoke to somebody three or four times during the day, three or four times during the night. Um, you know, the minute he entered that facility... We could never get anybody to answer the phone. Like we, mm -hmm. you could never find out what was going on. When my brother was there, at least he had a cell phone though, and him being coherent now and in good spirits, he was able to call us through his cell phone. So he did call us on, he, he got to the facility on Friday evening and on Saturday morning he did call and he was complaining about, um, you know, the environment. He stated that it was messy and, he didn't like being there. Um, when we spoke to one of the nurse aides there, they told us that he was exaggerating and that most likely it was his meds, that he was being a little delusional. Mm. And then um, the following day, which was May 10th, uh, my brother had called me at 9.30 a.m. and left me a voicemail. Unfortunately, I missed his call. Uh, he called my mother that afternoon around 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and wished her a happy Mother's Day. And then he also spoke to his girlfriend at the time um, around 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So he was somewhat in good spirits. And then around 7, 7.30 at night, um, a male attendee calls my brother's girlfriend and tells her that my brother fell while trying to go to the bathroom and had hit his head and passed out, but that he was okay. So his girlfriend asked to speak to him. Uh, he put my brother on the phone, and my brother was kind of slurring his words. So out of concern, she let him know that, you know, Rami wasn't speaking like he normally does. He doesn't sound as good as he did earlier, and if he could be seen by a doctor immediately. Uh, the male attendant told her not to worry about it, that they would have a doctor doing rounds that evening. Um, and then at 9.07 p.m., they gave us a call telling us that they found my brother in bed non-responsive non and he had passed away. So, yeah. And what's really frustrating is we were not allowed at all at the nursing home while he was alive. But now all of a sudden that he was dead, we were all of a sudden allowed to go to the nursing home and see his body and basically let them know what kind of funeral arrangements we wanted to do. So we all rush there. We get there probably around midnight, maybe a little bit after midnight. We're escorted um, through the non-COVID zone by the nurse aide, and then we're advised that we're entered into a COVID zone. Um, the entrance of the way was, like, covered in plastic. Like, you're walking through plastic. Everything is covered in plastic, the floors, everything, um, from ceiling to floor. And then there are people, like, on beds in the hallways just crammed. Like, you could see that it's just an overflow of patients that they cannot handle. Mm -hmm. um, we enter this room where my brother is in. Uh, to me, it looked like it was, like, utilized as a storage space for the nursing home. My brother was surrounded by these, like, closets 
and the closets were overflowing. Um, they had bags and bags piled up um, of other people's belongings. Uh, they're the they're the kind of clear bags that you get when you get discharged from the hospital. They have your name on the outside, but you can clearly see the belongings on the inside. Mm -hmm. There were markers and coloring crayons all over the floor, almost like children's, you know, were playing there during the day or something. And the mess was never cleaned up. My brother was there on a bed, nude with one sheet covering him. And, you know, obviously my mom broke down you know, hugging him and everything like that. Um, but at one point, I stepped out to find out where my brother's room was so I can get his belongings. And when I went up to the front desk, uh, the woman there let me know that that was his room. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. I was in complete shock. Like, I, I didn't understand, like, how that even was his room. Uh. Yeah. I couldn't even find anything in that room. I let her know that I was looking for his personal belongings. Um, she said that, you know, they should be there, but obviously there was so much junk everywhere. I couldn't find it. Uh, the only thing we managed to find was my brother's medicine bag. Um, but we never found like his charger to his phone. We never got his clothes back. We never got anything back from them basically. We obviously wanted to do an autopsy to find out what the true cause of my brother's death was, especially including the fact that we knew he had fallen earlier in the evening. But they let us know that, you know, they would have to talk to their medical director. Their medical director wasn't there that night and that they would have to get back to us. So in the meantime, I had my brother transferred to the funeral home and put into refrigeration to find out what we could do for the autopsy. Um, and eventually, you know, the nursing home got back to us and told us that that's not their responsibility, but also due to COVID that they will not do any autopsies. And then the, you know, come that Monday, I had to call my brother's dialysis doctor and let him know that my brother wouldn't be coming to his office. And, you know, the reaction from the doctors that attended to my brother from the hospital and through his dialysis they were all shocked. Like they didn't understand what possibly went wrong. And to this day, you know, we still don't have an answer. What's even worse is the funeral home couldn't even get a death certificate for my brother. So at one point I even had to call the police and, and you know, initiate an investigation just to get a, a death certificate issued for my brother. Um, and you know, after several, I guess, attempts and the police uh, arriving at the nursing home and a death certificate was finally issued and my brother's death certificate lists um, his death as a natural cause. Um, yeah, which I, I don't understand because my, you know, I should have said this in the beginning, but my brother was only 40 years old. Wow. You know, yeah. yeah. So, um I don't see how a 40 year old dies of natural causes. Yeah. You know? So some of the things that come to mind for me are he was, when you got to the room, he was naked covered with a sheet. So, so if that was his room and his clothes weren't there, I, I have all kinds of questions. I'm sure you have all kinds of questions too. Have you, well, um, I guess I'm just going to ask this question. Have you opened any sort of police case or anything like that to try to find out what happened? So through trying to get a death certificate initiated for my brother, I did pu uh, pull a police investigation. Mm -hmm. And through that investigation, um, you know, I got, I got different information. So the issue with running an investigation through the police force is this is not a criminal um, matter. It's more a civil matter, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so they can't really truly run an investigation since it's not leading to anything criminal that the you know district attorney would be handling. But they did run an investigation, obviously, to get me the death certificate. And through that investigation, the officer, the investigating officer was very kind enough to send me his notes. And I was able to find some very um, detailed things that just did not make sense at all. 
Um, for example, in his incident report, um, he shows that, you know, they called 911 at, and, you know, they basically, the paramedics came out, you know, to my brother, um, and the, the timing of the call, the timing of the, um, paramedics arrival and, um, them administrating CPR and all that is all after the timing placed on my brother's death certificate. Oh. So, yeah. So the death certificate time does not make sense. How can somebody be pronounced dead prior to the paramedics arrival prior to them administrating their CPR? And obviously there must have been somebody there to pronounce my brother dead. And who was it? Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still don't have that answer. Um, the death certificate is signed by their medical director of the facility that my brother passed away at. According to, you know, some regulations that came out during this pandemic that was allowed for medical directors to sign death certificates. But I don't understand then how the the uh, cause of death was determined, considering that we were more than aware that the medical director was not on premises when my brother passed away. Um, you know, and then we also know she never examined the body, considering that I had my body, my brother's body frozen at the funeral home. And it was never, you know, nobody went there to investigate or anything like that. So I never got, you know, any kind of answer or response as to how the cause of death was determined. Um, I had, you know, tried multiple attempts to get a call from her. Um, I've never been called by her, no matter what. Uh, at one point, the facility manager called me. Um, but again, I never got a call back from the director. The other part is when you get a death certificate, you know, the main cause is listed. And then, you know, underneath that will be underlining causes. And one of the causes that she has listed is renal disease. Um, and that my brother has died from renal failure, um, which again, looking at it from a legal perspective, you know, why would a hospital release a patient that was, you know, that intensely into renal disease that they could die within two days of renal failure? Some, mm -hmm. There's a something missing in between the hospital and the transfer to the facility. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing was... Uh, the death certificate lists um, hypertension, hyperthyroidism, which were things that my brother was suspected of when he was in his uh, early 20s and never ended up happening. So it's almost as though the death certificate was made as if somebody just skimmed my brother's medical records and just selected a few things and wrote it on there. You know, but unfortunately to this day, I've never ever gotten an answer from the facility. I've never gotten a call from the medical director despite multiple, um, you know, emails and phone calls, nothing. Um, I have reported the facility to the Division of Health. And um, at one point, they returned my call and said that, you know, somebody, invested, somebody visited the facility only like four or five days before my brother's passing and they didn't find any issues, which I find very, very hard to believe. And at this point, it's just kind of trying to figure out where or who to speak to to get help. Because unfortunately, back in March of 2020, there was some um, protection um, placed on these types of facilities and the hospitals that don't allow um, people like myself to pursue it legally to find out what really happened. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they... They did that here as well. I live in Oregon. They um, did legal action pretty much right away at the government level to give them immunity um, yeah. from any responsibility. And one of the things that strikes me is it, your brother passed away on Mother's Day, right? That's correct. <sighs> yeah. And... I have all kinds of thoughts I'm thinking about that right now too, but it was also, was it, was this the height of when things were um, just so overwhelming in, in the New York city area or was it yeah. after it was? It was. Yeah. 
So do you think that everything that happened here just, well, first of all, do you think that your brother had COVID? I do think my brother had COVID. I do too. Um, yeah. yeah. At that at that time, the testing was not accurate at all. It mm-hmm. was, I think it was like 50% accurate. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that if my brother didn't have COVID going into the hospital, he definitely got COVID while being at the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree with that. And so do you think that a lot of his care specifically, and probably a lot of the other people at that facility just fell through the cracks because they were so overwhelmed. Not that it's an excuse because it's not an excuse, but do you think that that's part of what happened? I do think that that's part of what happened. I think that the hospitals were overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I I don't think that my brother should have ever been transferred to the rehabilitation center um, or the nursing home, whatever you want to call it. Um, they clearly were way over their capacity. Yeah. Um, you know, to have people in the hallways on beds is not acceptable, especially during a pandemic and social distancing. That Mm -hmm. makes no sense. Well, and to be using what appears to be a break room. Exactly. That they should have said, no, we're at full capacity. Exactly. Yeah. Could he have come home and quarantined at home or quarantined with a family member who would take care of him and take him to dialysis? Did they even give you that option? They refused to give us that option. We, we were not permitted at all. And I, again, I think this is part of the beginning of the pandemic because when my brother passed away, we only had 80,000 deaths in our nation. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that little by little as the pandemic grew, you know, things like that changed. They decided to, um, you know, stop, maybe let you come home instead. But at that time, they refused to let us um, bring my brother home. Yeah. Had I know, had I known the condition of that nursing home, I would never have allowed my brother to go in there, even if it meant getting arrested. I would have yeah. never, ever let my brother go in there. Um, and again, if he wasn't positive for COVID, why would we put somebody who is extremely high risk and at their most vulnerable stage, if they have renal disease, you know, we all know anybody with renal disease is um, immune compromised. Mm -hmm. You know, why would we place them in a COVID zone? Yeah. And that's the other part. Like, so if my brother was negative for COVID, it's, it, it could make sense that, again, he was contaminated and he got COVID even at the nursing home and died within 48 hours because of his vulnerability. Yeah. You know, and if it was renal failure, there would have been a lot of signs that show that he was going into renal failure, like, you know, him turning yellow, um, maybe not going to the bathroom or not eating. Those are in- indications of all that. Um, and again, if the facilities were not overwhelmed and attentive enough, they would have noticed those things. And my brother could have still been here today. Yeah. You know, um, so I do think that my brother did have COVID. I do think that the hospitals were overwhelmed. I do think that the facilities were overwhelmed, you know, and it's, it's a very difficult position to be in because you do want somebody to have some sort of accountability. Not because, you know, you want to have somebody to blame, but all just to have that, you know, closure of where went wrong, what went wrong to know, you know, what could have been prevented, you know, to give it to give us the closure, but also to prevent it for anybody else to go through in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And and I'm wondering if you feel like you want to know if you could have done anything. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. it would help you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Have you, has your family had a memorial service or a funeral yet for your brother? No. Um. So when we got, we got my brother's ashes, uh, maybe three and a half weeks after he passed away. And again, at the peak of the pandemic, it was very strict. At that time, you could only have up to 10 people at the funeral and only two people inside at one time. And we decided it was too difficult to choose which 10 people would be permitted to go. 
so we didn't do anything. Um, we only did a, we had a pastor come and just pray over my brother's ashes, you know, for the religious purpose, but it was just, it was just me and my mother and my partner there. And we, again, we just did it for religion reasons. Um, and then our intention was to eventually have some sort of funeral or life celebration for him. But um, we still have not to this day. Yeah, just waiting until it feels like the right time. Yeah, basically. And, and it just never feels like the right time. Yeah, with so many unanswered questions. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. I think when we get, if we get those closures, if we get those answers, I think then it would feel like, okay, it's time to put all this to rest. Yeah. But it's difficult to put him to rest knowing that there's all these unanswered um, questions out there and, you know, we can't even get a call back or a response from anybody. Yeah. So you have been through the one year anniversary of when he passed away. Did yeah. you experience um, reliving it as those days passed by, like from when he went into the hospital and all of that? Did you have any um, um, worry or stress or anxiety about that? Um, I did. I'm sorry if my voice cracks. I'm getting a little emotional. It's all right. Um, I think my biggest stress was the fact that he died on Mother's Day. Um, you know, we we migrated to the U.S. and we are very Americanized, so most people don't know that about us. But um, we came from uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and we migrated here because there was a war when we lived there. Mm-hmm. And growing up, unfortunately, we saw some things that most people don't see in their lifetime. And we've lost some family members, you know, that unfortunately were casualties of the war. And the thing that haunts me the most is seeing my mother holding my brother and crying for her child. I think that's the worst thing I've seen in my life. So, sorry. Oh, it's fine. The fact that it happened on Mother's Day just makes it even worse. So, leading up to this Mother's Day, the anxiety, you know, I think every Mother's Day that's going to live with her for the rest of her life, too. And it's nothing that you can take away, no matter, no matter how many flowers you can gift her or cards or anything. You know, I'm sure that every Mother's Day that's going to be a constant reminder. And it yeah. just kills me because there's nothing you can do to take that away. And I think that it's just, I, I, I think that's the worst thing, a parent losing a child. I mean, I lost my sibling, and that is really bad. But it's just even worse to see your parent suffering. You know, I will never forget that. I will never, ever forget that. And yeah. this year leading up to it, it just was so, you know, like, you're trying to be creative of how to distract yourself from the anniversary day and then to you know distract your own mother knowing what the pain she goes through yeah. it, it just, you know it just it wasn't easy I don't know if it will ever get easy yeah you know I, I tell everybody this that day my brother died but you know a big part of my mother did too and it just, it hasn't been the same. It just has not been the same. Yeah. And with everything and everybody, and just in general, people thinking that they want everything to go back to normal. Right. And normal, <laughs> uh, you know, that's never going to happen for me. It's not ever going to happen for you or your mom. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, 
Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. I know that was so emotional and I, 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 I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be not easier, but less or, or your mom will be able to carry it differently right? as the years go on. What a, right. I, what a thing. I, yeah. You know, you don't know. And that's the sad part, you know, and I, and, and, you know, from speaking to other people and hearing their stories, I find the moms or the fathers that lost their children to have the worst heartache out of all, you know, yeah. and we lost my dad five and a half years ago or almost six years ago now. Um, and, you know, that that void will never be filled. But, I mean, even my mother has said to me, she said, losing a, a spouse, you know, is very different than losing your own child. It, yeah. it, you know, and, and, you know, my mom said, you know, your child is a piece of you, and to have that piece of you die is, and I totally feel for her. I, mm-hmm. I hurt for her more than I hurt for myself. I loved my mother to death. I would do anything to bring him back. Um, but I hate... I hate the way it, it really has hurt my mother. Yeah. You know, and it, it's it's the worst that it happened on Mother's Day. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's so uh I don't I don't know what to call it. It's just so ironic that it would be on Mother's Day. Yeah. You know, had he died maybe an hour later, it wouldn't have been Mother's Day. Um, yeah, you know, they say that a parent should never never uh, bury a child. They, uh, I've heard that all the time. And then there's all that unfulfilled, all everything that's unfulfilled. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And my brother and I, we, you know, we were Irish twins. So I, I'm only 13 months older than him. I've um, never heard that before. I have yeah. Irish twins. I Two <laughs> of my kids are 13 months apart. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's what they're called. I mean, People thought we were twins all the way till we were maybe 11 or 12 years old just because we were uh, so identical in height and everything. And uh, we were so close to each other. I, it's hard to explain to people, but I remember being 15, 16 years old and sneaking over to my brother's bed at night when we were supposed to be asleep just to talk to each other. You know, when you're that close of age, you, you tend to have a really close relationship too. Yeah, and that uh, um, leads me to what you're doing now for for your brother. So you you have a memorial for him. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So my brother would have been 41 years old on January 25th, 25th of this year, 2021. And uh, again, because we didn't have a funeral or anything for him, I wanted to do something for his birthday. I didn't know what to do. I just knew I had to do something, again, to distract us from the idea that it's his birthday and he's not here, and to give my mom some sort of uh, peace or closure as well. So, uh, leading up to it, I was collecting seashells from the shore. I live by the beach. Uh, So I was collecting clamshells. I know that I knew by then that the yellow heart was a symbol known for COVID victims. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it had started out in the UK and now it was spreading to the U S and I was aware of it. So uh, I started posting to social media, letting them know that I was going to do something for my brother's birthday. I didn't know what it was yet. And, you know, this was my concept that I was going to put a yellow heart on the beach made out of shells and put candles around it and light it up. And then I took it a step further and I said, uh, I'm going to write names on stones and put the stones inside the yellow heart. So I first opened it up to my community, like my my local town community, because I live in a small town and there's about 5,000 residents in there. And it was weird because I got a really positive reaction, which I wasn't expecting. And people were like, oh, I love this idea. I'll join you. And then little by little, I got a few names from them. And then there's a friends and family grief group on Facebook as well uh, for COVID victims. So I announced it there and I got, 
I got about, like, the day of my brother's birthday, we got about, like, 100, 120 names. Wow. Yeah, so we put them in there, and, you know, we were sticking to New Jersey only. Um, we let everybody know that the heart was going to be lit at 6.30 p.m. It was very cold that day. It was, like, 28 degrees out. Uh, so uh, once 6 p.m. hit, we lit the heart. There was about maybe 20 people that attended. Uh, it was really strange because it was nobody, like, it was me, my partner, and my mom, and, um, a friend, a close friend of ours, and then everybody else there, we, we didn't know. Like, they were complete <laughs> strangers. Yeah. How beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, they all had a loved one in the heart. So, there was a woman, her name was Teresa, and her mom, they, they did a prayer, you know, we all said the prayer together. And then there was a gentleman named John Walsh, who is a local, but he's very talented. He sung um, Danny Boy. And then um, there was a guy named Jerry, who's um, a local representative, and a woman named Sherry there. They were very supportive. They, um, you know, they basically just said a couple kind words. And, you know, everybody said their condolences, and we all left. Um. There was a girl even there named Jennifer, her father. She drove about 45 minutes. She lives in central Jersey. She was, I always remember her because when we were leaving, she approached me and she said, I, I lit a can extra candle for my father, but it's still burning. She's like, should I, uh, what should I do? And I said, just leave it there. I'll clean it up tomorrow because my, my mindset was, I'll just go back the next day, and clean everything up. Mm -hmm. and then I went home and you know we went to bed and I guess people posted pictures to social media and the next morning I woke up to 198 messages and yeah. I, I was yeah I was like oh my god like and I remember I looked at my partner I was like what's going on and my phone just kept digging 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 and at one point he's like shut it off because we we were like oh you know like what's going on like and it was one message after another like you know, asking me to put somebody's loved one in there. And I knew, like everybody else, you know, we were all so desperate to have some sort of visual memorial or closure for our loved one that I was like, you know, what's the harm? It's January. Nobody's on the beach. I'll, I'll add these names in there. It's not a big deal. I'll keep the heart there for another week or so. But then it was like, Every day, we were getting more and more messages. Like, one heart grew to two hearts, two hearts grew into four hearts, and it just kept growing. And within 45 days, we had over 2,000 names in there. Wow. And, yeah, we had over, uh, at, by that point, we had at least 10 hearts. Oh, and, my gosh. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I remember at one point looking at my partner, Travis, and he, he said to me, he said, you know, babe, like, do you want to stop? And I, I remember I was like, I don't know, like, and, and he was so supportive. He said, okay, well, whatever you want to do. And, and the next day we went out there again and we were putting, laying out another like 200 names. And at one point, um, I was confused. I didn't know what I was going to do with the memorial, but when we were there daily, people would thank us say, you know, this is so beautiful. Thank you so much. We, I didn't have a funeral. This is the only thing I have. I remember this old man. He used to walk there every day on his walker to visit his wife's rock. And he, he would tell us that that was the only place that he had to visit her because they still haven't done anything for him, for her. And he said, this is, I come here every day to talk to her. And he was very, you know, and, and so we're seeing these people. We're like, what, what do we do with this? What's going to happen? And I remember my mom at one point, she said, this is no longer about Rami anymore. It's, it's so much bigger. And I didn't know. I, uh, and then anyway, so one day there was a storm and the water came up very, very close to the memorial. It was like four feet away from where the memorial was. And I was scared, you know, like, but it, it survived. And when we went, 
um, the water did get close enough to take some things away. Like we had a bucket that had a whole bunch of rocks in it, uh, which was gone. And then we had some rocks outside of the heart and including my brother's rock. And all of a sudden it was missing. And I remember, I remember digging all the rocks out of the sand and, you know, a good 10 minutes, I can't find my brother's rock. And I remember like talking to talking to God at loud, like, saying, like, oh, my God, like, I know I didn't do all this work to save everybody else's rock, but we couldn't save my brother's rock. Like, where is my brother's rock? And, you know, like, asking God to help me find this rock. And I got so emotional. And then finally I find the rock. And so I look at my partner and, you know, I have tears. And, you know, I, I was like, oh, my God. So he looked at me, he says, now you know how everybody else feels. It's not just a rock anymore. And and that's the truth. And from that moment on, we decided that we would make the memorial a nonprofit. And we knew that eventually we were going to have to remove it off the beach. You know, our township was scared of vandalism and things like that by leaving it there. So uh, we, you know, raised funds. We, we opened up a GoFundMe. People donated uh, through a registry that we had the materials that we needed to lift the hearts off the beach. And now we are creating shadow boxes that contain the, the hearts with the names in them. We have a total of 12 hearts wow. and about 3,000 names. And basically, they're going to get moved. Uh, we are working on a permanent location. Uh, which we're in the middle of doing a contract for. And hopefully, if everything goes smoothly, uh, the Hearts will be having a permanent home in Wall, New Jersey, which is only 10 minutes away from Belmar. And there will be a garden built around it. And, you know, we are going to be utilizing the memorial to, you know, bring attention to the community as far as COVID goes, you know, educate people about it, but also, you know, bring awareness, honoring our loved ones. And the biggest thing that we want to do is find different ways and different resources to help other people heal, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, free grief counseling, whether it's some kind of monetary assistance, maybe, because there, you know, the thing with COVID is I lost my brother, but I also lost my job because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I got COVID too, and I survived. I have side effects. I'm a long hauler now from COVID. I know that there's a lot of people like me out there right now that are long haulers as well. And we have no kind of medical assistance for that. And then there's like, you know, again, from the memorial, we've met a lot of people. Uh, I think of one woman that I know, her name is Pam. Her husband was an essential worker. He was only three years older than my brother. He passed away as well. He worked at the hospital. And, you know, when he passed away, her son was only two months old and her daughter was two years old. Mm. You know, and when we think about, you know, the widows or widowers of COVID, you know, they lost not only their significant other, but they lose a lot of stuff. Like, you know, that's half the income, assuming that the relationship was Mm 50-50, you know, there's another woman, Michelle, that I met, you know, her husband was the breadwinner. She only worked part-time. And even since her husband has died, you know, her job gives her hours, but it's a part-time job. It's not a full-time job. And now she's, you know, at a risk of losing the house and, you know, losing so much more. Um, So there, there's just people out there that need that help. And, you know, there's also the children affected. There's over 53,000 children right now that are down to a single parent home because they lost their other parent to COVID. Yeah. You know, and again, we have to think about not only what does that do to their environment and to them emotionally, but also, again, the financial burden. There are kids now that can no longer go to dance lessons or you know, whatever extracurricular activities they did because their other parent can no longer afford it for them. Yeah. You know, there's just, you know, COVID it just affects so much more than just that one person dying. Yeah. 
um, you know, and we want to bring that awareness out there. But more importantly, you know, I want to use Eliza the Memorial to, you know, help others because what's even more fitting is my brother had a big heart and that's all he ever did was help other people. Like, I'll never forget it. There was a comment written on Facebook about him, some, you know, co-worker that she said, I've never met a person like him. Um, he truly never knew a stranger. And that, that was my brother. So it's almost humbling to know that this memorial can possibly bring all this healing and help to other people because that's what he would want. Yeah. And you, you have really, um, I'm touched by how much you brought a community together of people. Like I, I live out in Oregon and um, the state was very locked down. The outbreaks that here happened, happened later as far as the, when more people passed away. I don't know a single person. I don't know a single person in my life, in my circle who lost somebody to COVID besides me. Wow. Whereas you have met all these people and know people by name and have brought together this amazing community of people and done this wonderful healing thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it's, uh, definitely makes me feel like my brother's death didn't go in vain. I, I don't, in the beginning, I didn't understand why people were reaching out to me. You know, um, I've, I've spoken to people at this point from around the world. Like people always ask us like what our farthest rock is from where, you know? So the other thing about our memorial is, we decided that it wasn't going to just be national. It was going to be international. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is again, from speaking to people, doesn't matter where you are in this world or, you know, what side of the Atlantic ocean you're on, we all are suffering a very similar loss. So we decided that whoever wanted to include a loved one in the memorial, they were welcome to. And I think that, for me, speaking to people and, and hearing their loss and, and getting involved, it allowed me to see that I wasn't the only one uh, suffering, I guess would be the word. But also, I think the one thing we all have in common is, again, you know, COVID took away our tradition, you know, like, you couldn't have a funeral, you couldn't. <laughs> Not only, like, I think the worst part about all this was when your loved one died, not only were, were they isolated when they died, you know, you're told that they died, and now you're told you have to continue to stay isolated. So, yeah. you know, that grieving process is taken away. You know, we, we underestimated as a society what, you know, a wake or a funeral service does for us. It allows you to gather around people you know, that you would know that would love you and support you. And maybe they didn't experience the death, but they would be there for you. And with the way things happened, you know, you couldn't even do that for yourself. So now with the memorial, it's, it's, you know, if anything, it just brings people together because, you know, we could share that um, loss and we could share those feelings of, you know, we can empathize with each other, whether, you know, you lost your mother or father or brother or anything, mm -hmm. you know, we, we could, you know, familiarize with what it felt like knowing that our loved one died alone, or, you know, somebody could empathize with me knowing my struggle and how angry I was that we couldn't go to the hospital or we couldn't go into the nursing home. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, somebody even laughed. I told him, I said, you know, when my brother was in the hospital, this is a true story. At one point, my mother wanted me to drive around in circles of the hospital in hopes that we could figure out which room my brother was in and maybe we could get him to look out the window just so he could see our faces. Oh. Yeah. And, you know, to somebody who hasn't experienced that type of loss, mm -hmm. wouldn't understand that. But that's how desperate you would get when, yeah. you know, your, your, your sibling or your son or you know, your husband has been in the hospital for 20 plus days and they're not doing well and you want to give them some sense of hope. Like, so I think that 
I, I, you know, I didn't know all these people that I have met, I have met through the memorial. And I'm happy that I've met them, you know, and I appreciate every single person that reaches out. Um, it just amazes me on how we all, you know, have that same emotion, no matter where we are. Yeah. Um, you know, and some of us have experienced a greater loss than others. Like, you know, there's some, like, there's a gentleman named Karen. He's from the UK. He's from Ireland. He lost both his parents, you know, mm -hmm. like, minute, you know, hours apart. Yeah. You know, and again, it's, it's just, you know, you get to, there's some sort of camaraderie with these losses, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, you know? it's like a club you don't want to be in. Right. But yeah. Yeah, right. I remember early in the pandemic, I heard about a family in New Jersey that had a, a big party or a wedding. And then yes. five or six people in the family died within a few days. And I was so far removed from it then, you know, oh. visiting my mom with her Alzheimer's and her memory care. And I just thought, oh, it it just, it won't, it won't get that bad. Okay. You know, it, they'll, they'll get it under control. It'll, it'll be okay. You know, and I felt so bad for the family, but I also thought that that'll never, yeah. it'll never happen to me. And then, yeah. you know, my mom got COVID. So I have a question. Is there any one person um, you would like to name by name who you feel is responsible for what happened or who could have done more? Like, um, it could be a person in a position of power or something. See, I'm not a political person, but like everything else, whether it's a corporate job, whether it's a club that you belong to, you know, the, the top of the top makes the major decisions and it all trickles down. Mm -hmm. Um, I do blame the Trump administration. I think President Trump could have handled this a lot better. Um, I think he was very dismissive of it mm -hmm. in the beginning where, you know, it's it's that expression of better safe than sorry. Um, you know, I always wonder what would we have been like if he would have, you know, went ahead with the lockdown in February when the first cases came in. And, you know, if we weren't so dismissive about wearing masks and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. If he had done something, I feel like nationally too, because states right. being allowed to do their own thing, it just sent such mixed messages. Exactly. Exactly. But not only that, like I think about, for example, when he tested positive for COVID, you know, he was administrated the vaccine and things like that. He never exposed that to the public and said, Hey, you know, I got better because I got the vaccine. It was like a few days later, I'm not wearing this mask anymore. I'm not scared and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it gave that ex that expression as though, you know, there's nothing to worry about, but there's plenty to worry about. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, people don't think about this. As little as we want to say, oh, only 605,000 people died, you also have 35 million that got COVID and survived, but now are considered a long hauler because they have all these side effects. Yeah. So it's like, what kind of lifestyle are they going to have in the next couple of years? So surviving COVID is not, you know, as easy as it, you know, sounds like, like I, like myself right now, I'm struggling with things that I never used to struggle for. I can, I'm only 42 years old. I cannot drive the car for more than about 20, 25 minutes before having an issue. Um, I can't. What, what is, what happens? I get, I get extremely, extremely fatigued. Um, I lose my focus. If I try to fight it enough, uh, sometimes I'll get like a double vision. Hmm. Uh, so I just can't do it. I can't. Yeah. Um, it's more of a high risk at this mm -hmm. point. So I'm just taking it easy. Um, but also like I have extreme swelling all around my ankles and my legs. Like uh, it's a very high retention uh, to the point where right now I have shoes that are three sizes larger than what I normally wear because some days I can't fit my shoes. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
but thankfully for me, my coughing has really subsided. I do have an inhaler, just in case. I've never had asthma or any or any use of an inhaler prior. Um, and when you don't have insurance, you know, an inhaler is pretty pricey. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's that. I get these, um, I call them like, I, I don't, they're like these crippling headaches. They like, you know, you'll get, the headache will start and it, it, it lasts for days. Like if you take Advil or Tylenol, it just lasts for days and days and days. And then usually it gets worse before it gets better. I lost my taste of smell and, uh, you know, and my taste as well. It has come back, but it's back about 80%. So things that I used to enjoy don't taste the way they're supposed to anymore. Um, and this is, this is just a prime example. One day I was cleaning the kitchen. And, you know, when you're cleaning the knobs on the stove, I apparently turned the knob semi on. And I didn't realize oh. it. So now the gas is running. And you couldn't and smell it. I couldn't smell it. And I was cleaning the house and I laid down for a nap. And two and a half hours later, my partner came running in because he could smell the gas from outside. And was like waking me up and telling me like, there's gas. There, you don't smell gas? And I was like, no, what are you talking about? And he was, you know, opening every single window in our apartment you know, he's like, I, I could smell the gas. How are you not smelling gas? He's like, oh, you know, did you do anything? I'm like, no, I didn't do anything. I just cleaned the kitchen. And then when he went into the kitchen, he saw the knob that was on and he showed it to me. And I was like, oh my God, but I, I never smelt it. And so, you know, people, I, I think people don't realize that even if you're surviving COVID, it's not necessarily back to normal either, you mm -hmm. know, it, you, there's a there's a huge journey ahead and unfortunately um I do feel like you know our last president you know really dropped the ball on protecting us you know as a nation and protecting us as Americans and you know there's many of us that can also look at our state senators or you know our state governor and say well they didn't do the right thing but, you know, if the president demanded it, they would have had no choice but to listen. Yeah. You know, and I always tell people this all the time, like when they talk politics, at this point, I could care less who's to blame. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, whether you're Republican, whether you're Demo uh, Democratic, just step up to the plate and help fix it. Yes. This is the this is your time to be the hero. If you want your party to shine, this is your time to be the hero. This is your time to help us. You know, and 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 that's the other part is, you know, are is anybody really helping us? Like are we really preventing any more deaths? Like I said, you know, last March of 2020, we only had I'm sorry, May of 2020, we only had 80,000 deaths in the US. Yeah. This May, what, we reached almost 600. Now we're at 605,000. Yeah, it's in, it's just, it's insane. And I know it was at about 200 and I believe 20,000 when my mom passed away last August. Yeah. And yeah. still, even today, even today with everything that we have and all the precautions and vaccines and everything, people are still dying from COVID. Exactly, exactly. People are still getting COVID and our long haulers are going to be long haulers. Right, right. And everybody keeps saying, you know, we have to push, we have to get back to normal. When, mm. when, I, don't, when I don't understand, when we think of, you know, people like my brother's circumstances or, you know, the healthcare system as far as long haulers go, our normal was not a good normal to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, like, this pandemic has exposed so many vulnerabilities in our society. Um, you know, so I'm not really sure why we're in such a rush to get back to it. Instead, we should be in a rush to, again, heal from it and grow from it and make changes so that we're in a better place in the future rather than the same place should we be in the same predicament again. Yeah. And I, you know, like you, like, I'm sure every time you see that number hit another hundred thousand, it's really raw for me. Like mm -hmm. 
I, I remember when it hit 500,000, I cried for probably six hours of that day. And then when it hit another 600,000, I just stayed inside all a day that day because I was just so sad over it. Yeah. You know, and now, you know, to your, things are opening back up as though, you know, the pandemic is over and it's really not. No, it is not. Yeah. And there's so many issues with the vaccine and people not getting vaccinated, you know, there's so many different opinions on it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and then there's also, you know, not an equal distribution of the, the vaccine. And there's just so many things right now that still need to be addressed, you know, but I do, you know, going back to your original question, I do think that the Trump administration could have did better by us, you know, and I really wish that he had, you know, um, cared more for our nation um, and its people, you know, just to be more precautious so that we wouldn't have ended up where we have ended up. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying that it's not about politics anymore. I agree with you. It's not. I, uh, my person was, is Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. And I, still feel a lot of anger towards the choices that she made and the things that she did. Mainly what I come around to is that when locking the elderly away in nursing homes was not working, right. I wrote all kinds of letters and I complained and I did everything I was supposed to do to bring awareness to that, to try to get changes made so that eventually I could go back in or we could do safe visits. We could do rapid test results and then visits. But um, my governor was just, in my opinion, a stick in the mud and nothing changed. And I was so frustrated, but I can't do anything about it now, which is why I'm doing this because we can't just forget. No, no, we can't. And, you know, I, I, you know, again, with having the memorial, and bringing the memorial to fruition, um, you know, we get exposed to things that we wouldn't have been exposed to if we just stuck with it just being for my brother and letting it get demolished or, you know, letting it get dissolved. Um, You know, and you get that, you know, you get the back end of things of people like, oh, well, if you're going to do that, like, you know, why are we making such a big deal out of you know, COVID victims versus, you know, cancer victims and whatever. And, you know, I, I, I don't think people realize that, you know, when you, when you lose somebody, grief in itself is difficult to deal with, Mm -hmm. you know, but I feel like when you lose somebody, you know, in the, in the pandemic, the way we've lost somebody during COVID, um, you know, there was just so much of it that, you know, you were left to trust your governor or you were left to trust your, you know, president. Like, even in, in our case, like, I trusted the, the hospitals. I trusted that facility when they told me that my brother was exaggerating and it was his medications that were making him delusional. I trusted that. Mm-hmm. You know, I trusted that my brother was truly, you know, you know, hallucinating and the place wasn't messy the way he was saying it was and then to show up and see what it was you know that's the thing too we we had so much trust in our government we had so much trust in our president so it's very difficult of course not to be angry or to blame fingers and you know point fingers of where you know, which person made the biggest mistake or whatever, but in the end, there was just so much that went wrong. And that's where I, you know, I stress the fact that, you know, let's figure out what went wrong. And mm-hmm. rather than, you know, saying, you know, well, this person did this, okay, like, all right, this happened, this went wrong. What are we going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And what are we going to do to help those affected by it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Are you still taking names for the memorial right now? Yes, we are. Where can people send them? So they can, uh, so we have a Facebook page. That's the best page to get all the updates on. 
the Facebook page is called COVID-19 Memorial, and then Rami's heart, Rami is R-A, M is in Mary, I. So on there, you can just send us a direct message and, you know, ask us to add your loved one. Uh, we just ask to get your loved one's name. You know, we ask for a full name because it, that's what it's going to appear on the rock. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, you know, not to say just mom or, you know. Um, then we ask you for their city and state of where they resided in when they passed away. And we ask for, you know, you, the person that's requesting the name for your email. And the reason being is uh, the in our county, there's a historical museum here. And they've been documenting the creation of this memorial. And they've asked us to document all the names that come in um, because they've been photographing it and taking all this video footage for future exhibitions. So, Oh, that's beautiful. Because exactly. that could be part of a national, a exactly. national memorial or a worldwide memorial. Exactly. So, oh. like, yeah, so we get your information. So this way, let's say 100 years from now, I mean, we wouldn't be around, but let's say 50 years from now, there's an exhibition going on. You know, they, they kind of know who to reach out to or maybe where to start if they need to reach you in regards to your loved one. So, um, that's why that's we asked. Beautiful for thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, um, it, it, they were actually originally going to take the memorial when we were trying to save it off the beach, but once it got more than five hearts, it was too much for them to take. <laughs> oh, so. uh, what a beautiful thing. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to me and sharing your story today. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and giving me this opportunity to speak my story. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's just been wonderful. And I'm sorry. So sorry about your brother. And I, I talk to quite a few people and I really keep them in my thoughts and prayers like you and your mom, every mother's day, I are just going to be in my thoughts and prayers. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really do. And that's the show, everyone. If you've lost a loved one to COVID and would like to share your story on the show, please send me an email. My email address is for those we lost podcast at gmail.com. If you like this episode, please share the show. Share it with your friends, share it on your social media. And once you've done that, rate and review this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And then go rate it on Apple Podcast because that's where most of our new listeners come from. Ratings and reviews are the main way this podcast finds new listeners. So please share the show. Until next time. Thank you.